I really, really appreciate you coming on tonight. Before we uh, get started talking about the, the UKC and, uh, and the direction of the American bully, I just want people to really get to know about you. So we're going we're gonna to take it back a little bit. Where are you originally from? Well, thanks for the opportunity, Zeb. I appreciate it. Um, I'm from New York City. I was born and raised in New York uh, and then New Jersey after that. But um, it was a good time growing up on the East Coast. I've only been out here for about 14 years in the Midwest. How, how was life growing up there? Well, you know, I look back on it now and it's pretty rough. But, um, you know, I, it was all good. We Some really good people, hardworking people. Um, you know, we grew up pretty hard, my family, and um, I was the fortunate one who got to go to college um, and get out. Um, worked out real well. It was, you know, three jobs at a time while going to school, but it was worth it. And uh, met some just great people along the way and had a really good supportive family, too. Let me ask you, what were your dreams growing up to become? <laughs> well... You know, I think when you're a kid, everybody has these great big dreams, and, and I know I sure had mine. You know, I wanted to be a veterinarian, um, wanted to be a marine biologist, <laughs> but at the end of the day, we just all wanted to, um, you know, my dad, uh, his dad passed away when he was two, and uh, there were eight kids in the family, and they all had to grow up in, with just a mom and try to get out of the city where they were, and they worked real hard to do it. And, and I knew that my brother and I would have the same thing. You know, we'd have to just work hard. And, um, and we did. So our dreams were just to, you know, be able to get into a, um, a place where we could do what we loved. And I know for me, that's always been dogs. You know, my grandfather had dogs. My father had dogs. And um, were involved in the sport, too. So, um, you know, it was like everybody else. You know, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a vet. For me, it was veterinary <laughs> medicine. Uh, the problem was I took this class called chemistry, and that did not work out real well for me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you, Wayne, where did, where did you go to school and what did you get your degree in? I went to a place called Stockton State College. It's in South Jersey. And um, I went in there thinking I was going to be a marine biologist because I had already taken the chemistry. But um, my freshman year, I took a class in poetry because in high school, during all the tough times, uh, I always found that writing helped me get through, and poetry was just a gift. And um, uh, I had all these poems, and and I thought, well, this could be an easy class to take. You know, I already did this, and um, I got into the class, and I met a guy who pretty much changed my life. He was my professor there. Um, his name was Stephen Dunn, and he later on won the Pulitzer Prize um, in poetry. And I was so fortunate to have yet another good mentor. I've had so many good mentors along the way. He was my man in poetry. He was great. And um, he, you know, after a few weeks, he took me aside and said, you know, uh, if you want to get out of here, <laughs> you're going to have to pay attention and buckle <laughs> down. And, uh, and I heard what he was saying, you know. And um, I, I really did. And um, I just, it would, I just ended up, it just, hit me, it's what I wanted to do, and um, um, I poured my, my heart and soul into it and and had a really good time in school. Uh, I was the editor of the literary magazine, um, worked on all the writing committees, and uh, got through on my poetry, really, and writing, and enjoyed every second of it. Uh, see, a lot, a lot of people might not know this because, you know, we talked, uh, I guess, about eight months ago or so. Uh, we shared the fact that we both write poetry, like you said, and I was nervous. I actually sent you a copy of my book. And yeah. what, what, what did you actually think about the, the, the poetry book? Because it, it's not your typical rose. It's not your roses are red type of book. It's actually you no, know, no, pretty no, it's dark. Not. Sure, mine wasn't either. And, um I, I, by the way, I want to be—I want to get credit for. It. I'm that guy who bought your book off Amazon.com too. I just want to make sure yes. that's clear. <laughs> I was one of those guys. And y'all should do it if you're listening. You should buy that book. It's real good. Well, the thing about the book that struck me was it was so bare, honest. You know, it was just so revealing and open. And I think so many of us are afraid to put ourselves in a vulnerable spot by talking about our past and our life and. 
I thought a lot of the beauty in that writing was just that. You know, it was um, it was just real, and you could tell that you were really searching and finding a way to get through all that maze of the world by writing, and that, that struck a chord with me too. Like you said, it was, it was an escape to to write down what was going on through me during that time. So I, I can really relate to that. I'm actually excited because I just got my uh, letter from the Library of Congress for you know with uh, the the copyright number for my ISN second book. number, so yeah, oh, great. Good for you, man. Good for you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Let's talk about the dogs. You're a third generation dog fancier. Your grandfather yeah. bred Kerry Blue Terriers. Your father bred English setters and beagles, and you bred show and field titled English setters, pointers, and beagles. Can you tell me about that? Well, we're Irish, so we're all stubborn, so we all wanted our own breed, you know. <laughs> but my grandfather, <laughs> my grandfather was, you know, he he immigrated over here um, when he was a really young man. He danced his way over on the ship um, to get to Ellis Island, and he brought his carry, one carry blue with him, and he. Um, he he told me wonderful stories um, through his notes and letters. I was unfortunately um, he was he had died before I could talk to him or meet him, and I, that always kind of was a hole in my soul. You know, I always wanted to to get to what I would have loved to have get to know him. And his dogs were mostly working dogs on the farm, you know. Um, and my dad um, he had beagles and setters for hunting and showing, and it's just pets. Um, and he, you know, we didn't, like I said, we didn't have a whole lot, so we didn't go to <laughs> too many, we didn't go to Westminster or nothing, but, you know, we went to some local shows, and and um, and we did all right, you know, and I met, again, I met some great people who took me under their wing, and when I was 14, I was able to um, start working at shows on the road so I could go to more dog shows, and when I was 17, I... Um, Went to work full time right after high school um, for two professional handlers um, up in Connecticut, Bob and Jane Forsyth, and um, they were just wonderful to me and like second parents to me. And um, we we got I got raised on the road. You know, we had a big bus and we had 50 dogs in the bus and we had a crew of five and we just go from show to show every weekend and during the week. Um, he was a big, tough Marine guy, Bob was. And you'd work real hard on the road, and you'd work real hard all week, and he'd give you Monday off if you were real good. He'd give you Monday off. Uh, <laughs> and every time, I remember it was 100 bucks a week, and that without ta- you know, after taxes, it was $78 and change. And we worked 80 hours a week for it. You know? And I remember he'd hand me that check, and he'd say, Wayne, you ought to be paying me for this education, you know. And I thought, <laughs> you know, what a tough guy. But, you know, now I look back on Seb and he was absolutely right. You know, uh, the education I got, this is a 100 dog kennel. We take half of them on the road. We were at shows every weekend, every weekend of the year except for Christmas and Easter. And uh, we were all over the country. And, I mean, that's where I learned how to go out and eat at a restaurant. And that's where I learned... Table matters the hard way from a Marine, and, and uh, it's where uh, I learned to, to deal with the, the clients they were showing dogs for and met some just, you know, all walks of life, great people, people who are still my friends today um, and people who I still share love with dogs for. So it was um, just a lucky start for me to get that job. And, um, you know, as I said, I just keep getting these good mentors in my um, and. I don't know, half of it's just hard work, but half of it's luck, and um, they were great to me, just great. Let me ask you, Wayne, because um, how was the transition from what you have your degree in the school to to actually dealing with the dogs, and, and was the AKC your first start after after yeah, working in Copenhagen, America? I, I know it's, it's hard to connect those dots, but there is a way <laughs> the, uh, you know, my father was real proud that I was going to go to college, you know, and and then after my, I don't know, junior year, well, first, you know, I, after high school, I went on the road with the dogs for a while, and I was gone for a couple of years, and then I came back and went to college, and while I was in college, I worked weekends still at the shows um, all through college, and then I worked at the department store 
during the week um, at nights. And so there was a lot going on. And I had to write uh, for school, obviously, but I also love the dogs. So I was writing articles about dogs. And um, right after I graduated, I got a, a writing job with a um, newspaper called The Dog News. And I wrote for them for 11 years um, every week, a weekly column. Um, wish I'd saved some of them. Some of them were probably true. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah. during, that, during that time, you know, you feel so convicted in your feelings back then. And I look back now, I'm like, eh, I might have changed my mind on that one since then, you know. But I remember my dad saying, hey, it's great you're going to college and all, but what are you going to do, sell poems on the corner for a living? You know, what are you going to do here? And um, he, he was a little bit right. You know, I got out of school and I thought, well, uh, what do I do with this degree? And I did get a job as a technical writer, and I didn't do the technical part. I did the editing part, um, and I worked for a bunch of different uh, companies, and um, all of which were connected with telephony. So AT&T, Siemens Telephone, um, all the phone companies. I, I was a contract writer, so I'd work for a year here, six months there, and then go to another facility and write there. and. Um, as I was writing, I mean, you can imagine, I, mean, I know I know you can imagine this, you know, you're, you're thinking poetry and you're thinking about creative writing, and now you're writing a manual about, you know, don't forget to plug the thing in and close the perimeters and, you know, switch the switches. Uh, a totally different a, mindset. It, it was brutal. <laughs> so my escape at night was to write articles about dogs. And so I started to write for a few magazines, and um, I, I was – a little bit critical of the American Kennel Club at the time. Um, and some of those articles, I think, were, well, I mean, I think, I'd like to think they were, um, you know, critical in a positive way, uh, constructive criticism. Um, and I had just started judging dog shows. Um, I was pretty young, um, but I got approved to judge a few breeds for the AKC, and they were the big, scary guys in New York City. And... Um, I got a call from the president, Bob Maxwell, and he said, uh, I thought, man, I'm in trouble now, you know, for writing those <laughs> articles. <laughs> and he said, why don't you come on up? Uh, I want to talk to you. And I thought, well, am I in trouble? And he said, no, I want to talk to you about a job. And I'm, well, geez, I could use a job, you know. So um, I remember that day I had a, a 1965 F85 Oldsmobile that I bought from my Uncle Vinny. And uh, I hadn't, you know, I, we lived in Jersey at the time, and I had been driving for very long, and I thought you could just drive to New York City and park out front, you know. <laughs> and I found that you can't do that on Madison Avenue at 8 in the morning. So I was a little bit nope. late for the interview before I left this car, and I ran in there, and um, he was great. And there was this guy, the chairman of the board, Lou Oslander, who was sitting in the chair, with his back to me, he turned around and he looked at me and he said, son, I've got shirts older than you. And <laughs> I thought, well, I guess I'm not old enough to get this job. Um, we talked, though, for a long time, and and they were great. And they finally just said, okay, we want to hire you um, in communications. I said, well, I could do that. So I started working there, and um, a year later, um, I was elected vice president of communications. And... The way it works at the AKC is the time there were about 500 employees and the board of directors actually elects you to be a vice president. So it's not just a job you're elected every year. It's like a politician. You have to know, you know, when oh, wow. your year's up, you don't have a job unless you're elected. So, um, so anyway, I, I, I uh, stayed there for six years and, um, and then I had my, my differences in philosophy, and uh, moved on down the road. But at the same time, I was still writing, and um, I was writing for a bunch of different sources. And um, another just good thing dropped in my lap. It was a network called Animal Planet that was starting out at the time for Discovery. And I got a job editing a show there, and um, I ended up, uh, creating a couple series and directing and producing there, and, um, and then all the whole TV thing that came together from there. And I left the AKC and went full time to TV. 
that's when you were the executive producer, writer, and technical consultant for the Breed All About It show, correct? Yeah, Breed All About It, and um, and then a bunch of event shows too. Uh, I was <laughs> another just again, you know, just a lucky, lucky turn. I was at a meeting, and uh, we're as a copywriter, you know, just writing some ad stuff. And this guy came walking in. And, he looked like he was right out of central casting, you know, and a little short, chubby guy with a cigar, you know. And he looked and he said, who are you? And I said, I'm Wayne. And he said, well, we need someone like you tomorrow morning, you know, on the Today Show. And I said, well, I could try that, you know. And um, he said, you got to talk about dogs. I said, well, okay. So I got there early the next morning, and I guess I was too naive to be scared but you know a little while later i'm live on the today show with brian gumble and katie cork um talking about dogs and um it was about winter care tips for dogs how to take care of your dogs in the winter and when i came off i went to the green room and an agent called me and said i want you to do more of this stuff and he hooked me up and i started to do dog shows um as a commentator for dog shows and I did that for over 25 years. Um, ESPN, NBC Sports, Animal Planet, Discovery. And then um, for 15 years, I worked in for the BBC in England, the British Broadcasting Corporation in England, um, where I did commentary for the Crufts Dog Show. And Crufts is the, it's the biggest dog show in the world um, by a lot. Um, 26,000, 25,000 entries every year. Um, it's an event like you've never seen before. And there's about 300 and some breeds, and it's li- it's, it takes four days to judge this thing. So oh, we're live wow. every night. And it's, it's, I mean, you talk about adrenaline getting you through a job. You know, you're, we're there early in the morning, um, and we're going live until 9 every night. And um, you're... We're, I'm sitting there doing the commentary for the group rings. We do all the, you know, all the uh, B-roll stuff and all the interviews during the day, and then it, we're live at night actually commentating on the group judging. And you had to know 300 and some breeds, not just by sight, but you had to have something to say about them. Um, but, you know, when you're a kid and you, you grew up doing nothing but reading about that stuff and studying about that stuff and dreaming about that stuff, um, it, came, it came to me... Uh, fairly easily, and uh, I was lucky enough to keep working there for uh, for, for well 15 years, and uh, I had some great co-hosts, wonderful people to work with. Um, Ron Reagan Jr., uh, President Reagan's son, was my co-host for a couple years. Um, I would say he might be, if he's not the brightest guy I've ever met, he's he's sure close. Um, just a brilliant guy, and learned a lot about the world from Ron and, and, and others too, you know, it just was great. And then one thing led to another. And so uh, I uh, was working from home, uh, just writing for uh, Animal Planet and doing my TV stuff and um, had two babies along the way and a couple dogs and, uh, you know, it was, it was a good life, juggling a lot of things. Do you remember the day when you got the call to be a part of the UKC? And what was the yep. def- deciding factor in accepting the position as the president of the UKC? I remember where I was standing in the backyard. Um, during my time at the AKC, I was involved in a lot of stuff, um, including legislation, you know, um, breed-specific legislation and just general dog legislation. And, um, you know, we'd fight these BSL laws and we'd do a lot of lobbying and um We'd go to these meetings with, you know, Senate committees and things, and the president of the UKC then was Fred Miller. And um, he he was a big, tall um, – he, he looked way more presidential than I do, Zab, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, he was one of those big, tall, good-looking guys with a deep voice, you know. Um, he, but he was a great guy and, and just a, a, real, a real gentleman. And um, – he, we got to talking at these meetings along the years, and it wasn't much. You know, I barely knew him. And I'm in the backyard. I was 
building a deck on the back of the house, and the phone rang, and it was Fred Miller. And I thought, first I thought, Fred Miller, I wonder, you know, and then he said, President of the, oh yeah, that's Fred Miller, you know. And he he said to me that he was, he was, he was um, let's see, I was probably, I was in my 40s, and Fred was probably in his late 70s. And he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting older, and, and I need someone to, to run the UKC, um, and I'm looking for a guy who has, you know, dog experience and um, some business experience. Um, and evidently he was golfing at some golf course here in Kalamazoo and ran into some guy that is a dog judge, and my name came up, and um, I, I, that's how Fred called me. And, and um, I'm sitting there in Jersey, loving my life, you know, knowing all my neighbors. And um, Fred says, why don't you come on out to Kalamazoo? And I thought, Kalamazoo, what? Yeah, <laughs> I never <laughs> even heard of it. You know? <laughs> it just never dawned on me where the UKC might be, you know. And um, I said, no, I'm good. You know, I got my little writing gig going on TV thing. Everything's nice. And and Fred wasn't good at taking no for an answer. So he, he called me. Um, a lot. And um, one day my wife said, you know, I, I love you, honey, but you're kind of in the way here around the house all the time. <laughs> and maybe it'd be nice if you, uh, you know, got a real job. Uh, and I thought, well, all right, I'll take a look, you know. So I flew out and met with Fred and, and just, he's a good guy. And the more I got to talk to him, I really liked him. And I rented a car and, and um, I, I got a map, and I just started driving around circles around Kalamazoo. Um, and it, it's a beautiful place. Um, there's vineyards and, and beautiful hills and wooded lands, and um, there's a really good music scene downtown, and that's another thing I do, um, and that was attractive to me. Um, and I thought, man, you know, maybe I could do this. So I called my wife and um, said, you know, let's think about flying out here together next week. And we did, and she fell in love with the place right away. And the schools were real nice, and just a great place to raise a family. And um, you know, she was when we were dating. She was one of the the girls weren't quite allowed on my side of the tracks, you know. So uh, it was the brave girls that came over and dated us. And she was a she's a really just a brilliant, tough, loving woman who uh, you know she's very strong and. And when she made her mind up that she liked this place, I knew it was right for her, um, and I knew it was right for me. So I accepted, and um, Fred unfortunately passed away about uh, maybe nine months later. Um, and oh, wow. uh, yeah, and I was just really getting to know him, you know. And um, he he had diabetes and um, a bunch of other things wrong, but boy, he just was a just one of those guys that commanded respect no matter where you went you know you walked into a restaurant you just kind of you just had that air about him you know he's a great guy and the people love him that worked here so i thought well these are going to be hard shoes to fill and um and they were but um you know i got staff now that's just uh, they're just amazing you know, if anybody's ever seen our events and seen how hard everybody works um, you know, it was one reason, a couple of reasons that drew me to the place, the dogs, obviously, and Fred and the staff was, they're still here. There's, there's a bunch of people been here 25 years. Um, and this place is now 100 and, well, I've been saying 112 years for about two years, so it must be 114 years old now. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, yeah, it just, it just became home. And uh, my wife and I, we, <laughs> it, we kind of rolled the dice because, we had this house in New Jersey. It was our first house. And, um, well, what do we do? You know, we had, two, we had a kid in kindergarten, a kid in first grade. So we, we took a chance, and I rented a place at the residence in the hotel. And it had, like, one bedroom, a little living room and kitchen. And we had the kids and um, the dogs. And we, had, we had four at the time. Hotel allowed two, so we put two at a boarding kennel and rotated them. And we sold the house. 
We put everything we owned in storage in Jersey, just in case it didn't work out. And we drove out here um, in a van with goldfish and <laughs> dogs and the babies. And, uh, <laughs> and those goldfish lived forever when they moved out here, too. I can't believe it. But, but we moved in the hotel, and um, the kids got – it was August 24th. And the reason I remember that is because school started on August 26th. And we wanted to get the kids, you know, right into school the first day. So um, we live in a hotel, and I didn't quite have a job yet. You know, Fred was just kind of trying me out. And I um, remember my daughter said to me, Dad, when I go to school, what do I use for an address? And I said, well, we live in a hotel. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, what about what my parents do for a living? I said, well, we don't really have jobs right yet, <laughs> you know. And, uh, boy, it just... You know, a month later, um, Fred made me the offer, and um, we got a beautiful house out in the woods, and um, all the dogs and the kids learned to love it, and um, it just, boy, it was just great. It worked out really well. I'm really glad we took the gamble, and um, really glad we moved to Kalamazoo. Let, let me ask you, once you took over as the president of the UKC, what what was your vision 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 I'm sorry what was your vision for the UKC and explain the total dog concept Well I think you know even as when I first started showing dogs it was a man it was a different world you know um I I know I sound like the 200 year old man but it really was different and it wasn't all slick there wasn't all the professionals it was very family oriented not all these magazines, and they didn't have $200,000 handlers and ad campaigns. It was just bring your dog to the show, you know. And um, there was always something about um, about that whole feeling that I missed as shows were growing. And even as I was, you know, commentating on television, I was looking at these dogs thinking, man, they're getting too fancy. They're just getting too extreme, you know, that, um, I don't know how healthy these dogs are going to be. I don't know if they can do their jobs anymore. And, you know, I'd see basset hounds that were so low slung and so full of skin that I, my, we hunted rabbits with beagles, and I, I knew that basset hounds couldn't get through that field um, without some more legs and endurance. And I thought, well, here's a chance to shape a registry the way I want to. And, um, again, it was taking another chance, but... I said, well, I think what we want to do is change this whole thing and and try to require these dogs to do more than just look pretty. And we took over the total dog philosophy and um, and went on with it in a big way. And now, um, I guess the best way to sum it up um, is Premier, which is our big all-breed show out here in June, um, my first year, we had about 200 and some dogs entered. Um, last year, we had over 8,000 entries. Um, now, that's not 8,000 dogs. That's 8,000 entries because they enter several times. Um, and the reason they enter several times is because we have nine different competitions they can enter in. So they can enter in weight pull, obedience, agility, dock jumping, and the dog show. They can jump. They can enter a whole bunch of different events. And... In order for them to advance into the total dog group and best in show competition, they have to not only qualify in the confirmation ring, in the show ring, but they also have to get a qualifying score in a performance event that weekend. So they're going to have to get a qualifying score in obedience, agility, weight pull, dock jumping, lure coursing, uh, terrier racing. You know, we have this big, long rally obedience, um, and a bunch of new ones we're trying out this year, too. So my, you know, my, my goal there was, and I've got a, done a lot of work in health testing and worked on a lot of those, um, those committees and studies over the years with the Health Foundation, and I was a, I was a charter board member of the Canaan Health Foundation, and, um, so it was kind of a big deal to me. So I thought, well, the testing's great, you know. You can get, a, and you need to, get your dogs tested for 
cardiomyopathy, you know, deafness, um, Cushing's disease, all the everything you can possibly test for. Um, but there's also that test of common sense, and you can have, a, um, you know, a, a dachshund that has legs so short and body so long that its belly is touching the ground, and he could pass every health test there is, every every hip X-rays, heart, ears, eyes. He could pass every one of those tests, except the common sense. And the common sense test would be, you know, can you do something? Can you get there and do something um, on the ground that day, and then also be in the dog show? And you know, my thought is, well, this dachshund could pass every health test. But if he can't run through weave poles in an agility course or jump off a dock or race or do any of those things we offer, then he's not a sound dog. You know, he, he, like I said, he may pass every empirical test, but when it comes to the common sense test, um, that's where I think purebred dogs going forward need to focus. I mean, right now we just have, we just have to get... I think more serious, far more serious about making a goal for breeders to produce the total dog. And the only way I could think to do our little part here is to uh, make these competitions for the total dog so that people intentionally breed not just for good-looking dogs, but dogs can do something. And I don't care what they do, as long as they can do something that requires... I mean, you know, you see these Pekingese and Pugs, great dogs, wonderful dogs, but if we make their faces any flatter, they can't breathe. Um, If we make their nostrils any tinier, they can't breathe. Um, If Pugs have to have breathing flap surgery because their airways are restricted, um, we've gone too far. There's a lot of great Pugs and a lot of great Pekingese out there, but if we start exaggerating them like we are at these dog shows, some of them I'm saying, um, we're missing the total dog. Now, you cannot do any of those performance events without having legs, lungs, eyes. I mean, you've got to have, you got to pass the common sense test. You know, that, that dachshund uh, that passed all the health tests but is long and low, too long and too low, he couldn't do any of those events. So he couldn't even come in in the show ring for total dog groups and best in show. You've got to qualify before you come in. And, I don't know, to me... It was a real gamble because I, I knew the dog show snobs would just go, man, Kavanaugh's creating a circus over there. He's got all these events, dogs jumping in pools, and, you know, um, and all the elitists were very uptight about it. And, you know, um, they didn't want dogs off leash running around these events. And everyone thought there was going to be dog fights and all this stuff. And um, none of that happened, of course. It was just, it's just been great. And I was, you know, I was a little leery at first. I thought, well, we're, I'm not going to compete with the AKC. That's silly. They do what they do, and they do it real well. Their dog shows are absolutely, I mean, they are spectacular, you know, in, in the true sense of the word. You know, spotlights and glitter and all that stuff, and that's great. And um, for people that want to do that at that professional level, totally appreciate it. I do it. I do it to this day. Um, not very often, but um, I haven't been in the ring in 10 years. But, I mean, I go to those shows, and... I don't want to compare with that or compete with it. I want something different. So I wanted shows for, you know, just the everyman that could come in with a good dog and, you know, um, walk in there and and if his dog isn't the most beautiful, at least he's got some other events to compete in. And if he's both, that's even better. Um, And hopefully people can start selecting for traits that can both look good and be healthy and sound. And I mean sound in body and in mind. That's a great concept. Because what it does is that it puts the breeders on notice like, hey, we want to, we need to have a complete functional dog in order to be a part of this, this uh, registry. Yes. And because you know, I've been breeding dogs for, for all my, I've breeding dogs all my life. And, you know, if you breed dogs long enough, any breed, and I've bred more than one breed, um, you'll you'll soon find that 
even with the best intentions, bad things will happen. You know, you will get, every time you breed a litter, you're rolling the dice. And, you know, genetics isn't perfect. And um, things happen all the time. And if, if you're going about it um, without trying to um, better the breed, without making a better, healthier dog, you're getting enough curveballs thrown to you. You got to stay on the straight track and just try to make better dogs. And um, I'm not saying you're going to slip once in a while because you are, but um, at the end of the day, it's all about if you breed for this generation, if you breed because you want those puppies to win, you're not doing anybody a favor. If you breed so that that family of dogs can continue to produce well, and the, and you're and you're planning three generations ahead, four generations ahead then you've got a breeding program and you're not just breeding for money. You're not just breeding one-off litters for money. And uh, for me, that's, that's what it's all about. And, uh, and I, you know, like I said, I completely am cool with people disagreeing and um, with people wanting to do the, you know, a fancier way and just a dog show way. I think that's great. Um, there's got to be options for people. But for the people who choose to come do what we do, um, they know when they get here if they like it or not. And if they don't, they don't come back, you know. Um, but we have a good time. You know, this is a dog show where people do the wave, you know, around the ring. Um, <laughs> you know, if you look on our Facebook page, I hope it's not there, probably still is. Um, last year I judged Total Dog Best in Show, might have been two years ago, I think it was. And a woman, a really, this woman's really tall and um, big, strong woman, and she has pit bulls, and she's great. And she, I'm in my jacket and tie judging at this show because it's our fancy show where you wear a jacket and tie. And she picked me up and swung me around the ring like a rag doll because she was so happy she was. <laughs> and I thought, that probably won't happen at Westminster this year. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, we have a good time. And, and um, we try to keep it light and keep people laughing. And uh, everybody cheers for each other. It's, it's a, I mean, I'm not saying it's not competitive because it is. But... Um, people are there to have a good time. And you can just tell when you get there. It's like Woodstock for dogs. You know, people throwing frisbees and running around. And the big thing is no professional handlers. And to the bully world, I don't know if they've experienced what it's like to go into um, a registry that has professional handlers, an all-breed registry like the AKC, for example. And these guys are good, and that's what they do for a living. And they've, you know, they've shown to these judges they know what to bring and, it's hard to beat them. So, and it, to me, it just seems to get a little too, and by the way, I work for a professional handler. So I mean, my best friends are professional handlers. Nothing wrong with them again. But I wanted a place where you could come and not be intimidated. You've never been to a dog show before. you got a dog and you want to come. If you come to one of our shows, people will, you know, welcome you with open arms and there won't be any pressure because there's nobody that's pro. Everybody's in the same boat, all amateurs. And um, I think it just levels the playing field in a nice way. And it makes people really try to help each other. And, and um, it's just been really cool to watch. And I've seen some, you know, I've seen little kids in the ring. And I've seen senior citizens in, in the ring. And I've seen them both, you know, fall down and cry when they win. And, um, you know, it's just there's so many moments like that that uh, make it all seem worthwhile for me. And um, I'm just glad I had the chance to try. Let's get into the American Bully. July 15, 2013, the United Kennel Club recognized the American Bully as a breed. Let me ask you, Wayne, how long was the process in researching before you decided to make the announcement? That's, that's the first question. And the second question to that is, did you have anybody on your committee with other registries involved in the process that had experience dealing with the American Bully? We, well, the first thing was it took us about, from start to finish, it was four years. And um, it all kind of came about at the same time. We had, um, we had you know, I, I don't know, I mean, it's just because of the way I run things here. We have 50 employees, but every single um, American Pit Bull Terrier application, single, that came in with pictures, um, was reviewed by a guy who used to work here. Um, and... It was, um, it, it didn't work out, and, and I took over doing that myself. And as the years went on, um, I noticed that there were just too many dogs sneaking in that there's no way they were purebred APBTs. And, um, you know, we reject them, we rejected a lot of them. And a lot of them were registered with, 
with bona fide hundred year old registries too. Um, but that didn't matter to me if they didn't, you know, if if they weren't if they weren't looking what we're looking for, we weren't interested in bringing them to the gene pool. And it got to the point where I thought we're not, we just have to close this registry. I am not going to keep APBTs open anymore because there's too many dogs coming in here looking like they're crosses, and I don't want them in our gene pool. So we shut it down, and, man, everyone said, well, now you lost your mind, Kavanaugh, because <laughs> you're going to lose all that money. You know, every year all those singles come in of APBTs, and, and I thought, man, if you knew me, you'd know that that is not <laughs> why I do this, and <laughs> you've... You've got to make. You got to wake up in the morning, look in that mirror. And for me, you know, it's about the dogs, and um, we got to make better ones. And the, for me, uh, the way to do it was to try to sort out that gene pool and APBT. So um, we closed it, and three years later. So we've been talking about this for a year before that. Closed it down, and three years later is when we opened it back up and let bullies in at the same time. Um, We've been to a bunch of shows, um, and um, we saw some nice dogs. We met some nice people. Um, a bunch of us went individually just undercover, had a great time meeting people. We figured if they knew who we were, they'd be all just, you know, like, I don't know. We just wanted to be treated like everybody else just coming to a show for the first time. And um, boy, I tell you, the people were, people were amazing. The bully people were awesome. And... That's, it's just so nice, you know, when you go in these places not to be judged. and um, It's not that way at every every dog show, you know. So that was cool. And and then we had APBT breeders on the committee as well. We didn't have anybody that bred bull... A, we didn't have anybody that bred bullies on the committee. But out of six people, we had 184 years worth of dog breeding experience and about 70-some 70, 70 years in APBTs and also a bulldog breeder and a bull master breeder um, who just happened to work here that were on the committee. Um, but it was a lot of soul searching too. But there was a, one of our guys, and really I, I'd love to take credit, but, but there's a guy in, in hunting operations, um, Todd Kellum, who's just an amazing, amazing human being, just one of those, you can't find him like that, honest, super straight shooting guys. And he came in one day and he said, you know, why are you ripping on these bullies? He said, look at this. And he showed me a video. And it was a bully kennel. And it was a guy who was throwing sticks off a dock. And these bullies were jumping off the dock into the water and retrieving the stick. And um, he said, what's wrong with these? And, you know, I looked and I thought, well, you know, that is what we're all about. You know, dogs can do things like that. And we can either sit here and complain about the exaggerations or we can find the good dogs like that dog and try to sort something out. So I actually called that guy um, who had those dogs that jumped off the dock. And, man, he didn't. He was scared to talk to me. <laughs> you know? uh, it took a couple phone calls before he'd finally open up a little bit. But um, ended up being a really good guy and, and, and a bunch more. So um, we talked to a lot. We talked to, well, I wouldn't say a lot of bully beers. We talked to three or four. Um, but they weren't on the committee. I can't make believe they were sitting there with us in the room. Um, but they gave us a lot of good input. But a lot of it's just based on, you know, if if you're in dogs all your life, um, yeah, I'm a, I judge every breed there is all over the world. Um, I've been real lucky that way. Um, you can you can read a standard and you can look at the history and and try to figure out what you want to do. And in our case, what we wanted to do was our version of the American Bully which is not the only one, and um, it's just the one that we kind of like. It's, you know, it's the, more of the classic style, and um, we decided that was going to be it, one standard, um, one type. Um, you know, I don't know how it's going to go down the road if that ever changes. Things evolve over time with breeds, but um, we wanted to just get, get it where we wanted it and, and uh, try to describe a dog that would work in our registry. And, um, we are getting some really, really, really nice bullies in. Um, just had two pictures yesterday that were just breathtaking, beautiful dogs. They look like they could tear a house down, um, but sound and just with it and alert and um, um, great stuff. So it's been interesting, though. I can tell you the disappointing thing. 
Let, let me ask you about the standards since you brought it up. That you said sure. the American bully was in, was influenced by the infusion of several other breeds, which included the American Bulldog, English Bulldog, and Old English Bulldog. Now, yeah. Let me ask you because you know, in other registries they said it was just created from just the Amstaff American Pit Bull Terrier. In your opinion, the way you've seen bullies today, is that even possible? No. With the bone, <laughs> I mean, with the bone and girth. Yeah, I I can't. You know, you can select for a lot of things, Eb, and, and maybe, you know, there's somebody out there that's done that. But um, I've shown a lot of Amstaffs at AKC shows, a whole lot of them. I've showed a lot of Bulldogs um, in my life. I've, you know, I've, I've um, whelped puppies from, from those breeds. And, um, you know, I've, I've actually even done an autopsy on an Amstaff with a veterinarian and a doctor um, just to look at the anatomy. And I can tell you that, I look at these pictures, and it takes me two seconds to say, you can't have a top line like that. You can't have a corkscrew tail. They just don't pop up. You can't have that much under jaw. You can't have that bow to front. Um, you certainly can't have that rib cage configuration and the, the way that the, the rise of the loins and of the croup. It just doesn't happen um, without some creative crosses. Now, with that said, I want to be real clear that I think one of the things in the purebred dog world, and this is this sometimes makes people unhappy, um, one of the things we've done wrong in purebred dogs is thinking that that's it. They're all pure now and we've got to stop. I think that's where we get in trouble, and I have no problem crossing breeds. I don't know why people would want to hide about that. Um, there are English setters, Irish setters, Gordon setters, and Irish red and white setters, four of them, and they all came from the same stock. And... It was people that just wanted to select for a certain feature, and they did. Um, we don't have 400 breeds on this planet because Mother Nature went, bam, there you go, 400 breeds, you know. Um, people were trying to improve a breed or change it to their liking, and I have no problem with that happening. Um, the problem I have is where do you draw the line? So what we're looking for is dogs that we think are far enough away from those crosses, and if they're not crossed, that's even better. Um, but far enough away where we think that they can be, can, they can breed consistency. Um, and that's really, you know, I don't know what a purebred dog is. If someone can, you know, there is no such, I had this argument with some Genesis not too long ago. There's no such thing as a purebred dog. You know, um, 99% of the DNA in dogs is the same as wolves. Um, there's only that 1% that really makes them into all those individual breeds. So they're all related. And, uh, it was a DNA lab in California that was trying to do breed-specific testing uh, by telling you how much golden retriever was in your golden retriever. And I told them they never get past 60%, and I was wrong. It was 68%. Um, but the rest of it they couldn't define. You know, I mean, you run golden retriever DNA, and you're going to come back with Mastiff, Tibetan Mastiff, uh, Irish Setter, Labrador. It's all in there, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's how we got all these cool breeds. But it's time to say... Enough's enough, and that's why our commitment to the bully was, let's create a breed standard. Let's look at the other breed standards out there, by the way, and we obviously did if you look at it. Um, create a breed standard, create our own criteria, and start bringing these dogs in the registry and seeing what kind of consistency we have. And once we got that going, we know we have a breed, and we know we have a breed now. I mean, there are dogs coming in here who are reproducing dogs who look like themselves on a regular basis, and um, and the ones that come in that don't that don't look like they are, they don't get registered. And we reject them every day, and we get phone calls every afternoon. Um, but you know that's just the way it is, and um, we've just got to stay true to it. And some days I'll get a hundred, and I'll throw out fifty. And some days I'll get a hundred, and all one hundred pass. Um, it's really, you know, it's it's a matter of of going through everyone because at this point. When you're establishing the foundation stock, this is when it's time to be ruthless. This is when it's time to go, that's too exaggerated. I can't do that. And, or that has, and you can, I mean, these color patterns don't pop up. You can't breed Amstaff to Amstaff and get a white base with, with black ticking and a corkscrew tail and rose ears. It just doesn't happen, you know. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there are some people that did. Um, but AMSTAFs don't look a whole lot different than APBTs as far as substance goes. 
So to get from an APBT and an AM staff to something that's got a you know a head that they measure now and a front that's twice as wide, that's that's hard to do. You know, that's pretty hard to do. <laughs> so I, I just you know, and when I, I if you ever saw the pictures I see every day, you would say, "Are you kidding me? Are those guys serious trying to get that through?" And they are. And I can also tell you that sadly enough, a lot of those dogs that come in here that to us are too exaggerated to be a bully, uh, way too different than an APBT, but too extreme to be a bully, have papers from other purebred, all breed, not ABKC, all breed registries uh, in America. And it blows my mind that those dogs are registered as APBTs, they want to come in here as a bully, and they're too extreme to even be a bully when they get to here. Um, so not every registry is perfect. You can't go inspect every dog. But when you get the chance to try to straighten up some foundation stock, you got to try to do it. Is it perfect? No. Are dogs going to sneak in? Yep. Are people going to cheat? Always. And the other thing is, you know, someone was saying um, to me in an interview, uh, you know, you, you're stealing my breed or something like that. And I said, well, uh, no one owns a breed. But more important, you all can do it. Everybody can do what they want with their dogs, you know. And that's the beauty of this country. You can, you know, you can do what you want. If you want to make them really big, really small, really long, purple, pink, whatever you want to do, that's fine. They can't come to our events, and that's fine. There's other events, I'm sure, for them. But um, we're just looking for the kind of dog that meets sort of our philosophy, the total dog, the whole healthy total dog. And I have no problem with foundation stock that goes back 20 years that may have thrown in an American Bulldog or something, if it now has shown consistency over a long number of years, um, and we know they're going to breed true. Um, and that's hard to do. You know, that's why it's a four-year process to start the thing up. Um, a lot of people were, you know, why is it taking you so long? Well, <laughs> um, this is something you got to go slow with. It'd be easy to make money and turn it on right away. We didn't accept APBTs for three years. That cost us a lot of money. That wasn't the idea. The idea was let's sort this out with the APB. We wanted the APBT gene pool to be clear, and we didn't want to throw out these good dogs. So we've got these dogs that are good dogs, good athletic dogs by that, I mean, but not APBTs. What are we going to do with them? Well, if they look like American bullies, we can bring them in and try to sort it out in a way that we think works. And again, there's n I have no problem with other people doing it other ways. It's just the UKC way that we're doing it, and you know that's all it is. You know, a lot of people might might not know this, but you know, I was really surprised doing it. I guess about that during that time eight months ago that you had reached out to me and actually said you had saw my videos. I was, I, it kind of blew me away <laughs> about that. <laughs> the videos were awesome. And, you know, I was working TV, so I know how hard that is to do. But that was real stuff, man. Some of those guys you had talking were just, you want to talk about passion for a breed, the bully people and the pit bull people. Well, most dog owners. But, man, I'm telling you, those bully people have more passion. And I was on with... Um, bully the kid and there's some people calling and screaming and cursing at me and stuff and I thought that was great because what it meant to me was that they have passion for their breed they don't I don't want them to agree with me they don't need to agree with me but I want them to have passion for that breed and if they have passion and they have real true love and passion they're going to make healthier dogs they're not going to get into it for money and make these extreme things they're going to get into it to improve a loyal loyal companion breed and there's no better breeds, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, for companions. I just, you know, I, I love this breed, and I love APBTs, and there's a lot of breeds I love. But, man, you want to talk about a total dog? It's really the APBT is the, is the dog this registry was, was built on. And the first dog registered in 1898 was a white bull, a pit bull terrier. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things that we pride ourselves on is that history. And, um we should love them. And I, yeah. like I said, if if you're in a breed where half the people hate you and half the people love you, you're in the right breed. <laughs> that means you got passionate people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was just happy, you know, to make that connection uh, to get you on that, uh, to talk to the bully community during that time on Bully the Kids show. I was I was happy to really uh, make that connection to get you on well, to talk to the bully community. It. I remember just that's when I was going down 
I was on the internet looking through bully kennels, looking through stuff, and I remember reaching out and calling you. You were the second person I called, I believe, and the guy jumping off the dock was the first one. And there was a bunch of others. And, um, you know, that, that was part of the research that no one ever talks about, you know, was all those wild calls that um, just reaching out. And I can tell you, some people just hung up. Some people um, thought I was kidding. But a lot of people were really honest and open and sharing their ideas about the breed. And I think that's just great. Let me ask you, Wayne, uh, since we're, we're eight months later down the line now, as far as the registering of the recognizing the American bully as a breed, in, in your research, have you found any kennels yet out there that you consider good breeders of the American bully? Yes. And no, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I almost thought you were going to say names. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, they really are, and they're consistently breeding good dogs, and um, and I can tell you, there's some that are consistently breeding bad dogs. There's a couple dogs that uh, that when they come in on a pedigree, uh, I don't even care. You know, if that dog is close, I want a real good look because if that other dog's in his pedigree, he's not coming in. So you know, it, it's not like I said, they may be great dogs for somebody else, just not for us, and. Um, but there are. There's consistency. It took a while. It took, like, uh, the first three months, we didn't see many. And then we saw a whole bunch. And then some bad ones came in in a bunch. And then the word got out on them, I guess. And then we got, we're got just getting real good ones in the last six months or so. Oh, wow. Let me ask you, because this, this is a question that comes up a lot among the bully community. What what do you say to the to the people in your community of the UKC community uh, that say that why you want to bring this breed in when when these people are, are basically thugs and game bangers, which is which is part of the perception of the breed that you find sometimes that people think that way. Yeah, because think, like you, you said, know, you've been lucky. you've been you've under you've been under undercoverly to to the different shows, and you can see where there's all wide vast ranges of, of lifestyles. Yeah, and, you know, and I think the good thing about the UKC is that, um, you know, our people, primarily our American Pit Bull Terrier people, which is our biggest breed by far, um, and they do dominate at the shows as far as entry goes, and um, they're just, you know, they're our biggest customers. Those people have been through the same stuff. You know, I mean, they've been through getting barred from a city you know, no pit bulls allowed in Denver here and there. And, you know, they've been they've been cast the same way. You know, they're the thugs and, and they're the bad guys too. Um, so they're a little familiar with it, and I think they have a whole lot of empathy for it. In fact, for most of us, we just don't even see it. You know, once in a while, someone will say something like, have you been to one of these things? Because we have a, a coonhound uh, sponsor for our coonhound events, um, sells dog food, black gold dog food. And... Um, He's a coonhound guy, you know, an old country boy coon hunter. And I see his ads at bully shows, and I called him and said, John, what's, uh, you know, what's up with this? He goes, you've never met cooler people. He said, we have the best time ever. And this is a good old boy, and he loves coming to those A.B. Gacy shows, and, and um, he's a big sponsor. And, um, you know, I think when you get into a sport like dogs, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you really have a passion for this you're not even thinking. I've known people for 20, 30 years in dogs that I cannot tell you what they do for a living. I can't tell you what their religious or political affiliations are. I can't tell you anything about their outside life, but I can tell you every inch of how passionate they are about their breed. That's all we have to talk about. So those things are set aside. You walk in there, it's about the love of the dogs. And I think it's, well, if you've been to, you know, if, you, if people are thinking AKC shows on television, yeah, I can see that those people would think, you know, maybe that's a different crowd. But our people are a much wider demographic, much wider, and much more accepting. And we just, I don't know, it's not been a problem for us. Um, I think the bigger problem was people were, um, people were, you know, were not liking that, that the, uh, not the real bullies, but the bullies in quotes were sneaking in or trying to sneak into the APB gene pool. That's what, Okay. That's really the only holdback we have. Let me ask you, Wayne, how close are, are, is the UKC right now uh, for the American Bully to be a part of UKC events? Well, I think, we, you know, we've got, every time I um, 
you know, the, the, the world today with Facebook and Twitter and all that, if you mention something like soon, they mean tomorrow. And if, if you mention you're thinking about it, it means you already thought about it. So, you know, it's hard to get into those words. But um, I, I can tell you that we are certainly planning on it. But like everything else, yeah, we could have made more money by opening up shows real quick and making a big clash. But we really want to get... We really want to get this gene pool sorted out. We want to make sure our judges are trained, and they are required, our judges, by the way, to come to uh, a two-day seminar on judging dogs and the total dog philosophy, a two-long, two full long-day seminar. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sorting out the judging, we're sorting out the events, and we've got to get uh, the bully people familiarized with our performance events because we want them to um, be part of the total dog competition. So it, it takes a while, but um, it's, it's come, and I think, you know, we want to do it right. We don't want to do it soon, and we want them to definitely be part of the whole fabric of the UKC, the whole performance dog, the whole total dog thing, and I think they're going to love it. Um, let, me, let me ask you, Wayne, because uh, I, I think I read one time, uh, your dream is that every dog at a UKC show will need a performance title and a health certificate to get in the show ring. Could you, could you explain more on that? Yeah, I and mean, that would be my goal. I mean, we're getting there, too. Um, as it is now, at dog shows, you have groups of breeds. You have hounds, sporting, you know, gun dog, we call them, toy, non-sporting. And all the group, all the breed winners go in their different groups, and then they go for best in show. And we have two sets of those. We have the regular dog show, and then the premier and gateway, we have the total dog groups in best in show. So we already have a set of groups in best in show where you are required to do a performance event and the dog show part. And I would like to someday see all of our competitions be that, where you can't come into any UKC show ring without passing the performance test first. Now, you can't do that overnight, and um, we're doing it actually quicker than I thought um, because people are, are embracing it. They're coming in droves. But the next step would be, okay, so that's the common sense test, the performance test. Now I want to see your health tests. So... Wouldn't it be cool if we got to the point where you come to a dog show and every dog there was x-rayed for hip dysplasia, um, had its bear testing for hearing, uh, whatever other tests are available for that breed. Now, you wouldn't have all of them because it doesn't exist yet, but at least you have a few of them to show those breeders are conscientious. And if you have that plus the performance event and good looking, then you're breeding some total dogs. Then you're breeding dogs that when they don't make the show ring, or they don't make it uh, as your breeding stock, you can place those dogs as pets and know those people are getting a healthy, hardy, athletic family companion that will last 15, 20 years. Not something that's going to explode in the heat or have difficulty breeding or breathing or anything else. And we've got to think about those dogs that aren't going to the shows. What are you producing that's not going to the shows? Those dogs are going to be someone's, they're going to break some kid's heart. And you want to breed those dogs to be better because you don't need that. People buy these as family pets and because some guy wanted to make money and make them all exaggerated. And, and I'm not talking about just bullies. I'm talking about all these exaggerated breeds. There's plenty of them. Um, then you get some four-year-old kid who's falling in love with this dog who then can't live more than six months. And that's just not where we're at. So um, that's what, you know, yeah. Sometimes I know it's, it's like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain. It keeps rolling back down and hit me in the head. But, you know, we, we keep trying. And uh, we keep trying to do a little by little. And hopefully, like I said, um, we're doing an interview for a TV show a couple of weeks ago, and the interviewer asked me, you know, how many dogs do you, do you want to save? And, and I said, one. You know, that would be a good start. I don't know. Maybe we've already saved thousands. I don't know. I just know that the goal has got to be one at a time. And the way you do it one at a time is to give them events where they can prove um, that they're good-looking dogs that are healthy and can do something. Let me ask you, Wayne, before we wrap this up, I want to ask two questions. I want to explain this to the people because it was, it was very interesting to me. Can you explain the popular sire syndrome and the, and the concern of the extreme exaggeration? Well, I think the popular breeds, the popular sire syndrome – is the most dangerous thing in America as far as purebred dogs go. Um, no one talks about it. Everyone's afraid to talk about it. Registries are afraid to talk about it because they're going to lose business. Um, 
A popular sire can be a real good thing, but it's a real slippery slope too. Golden retrievers are ubiquitous. They are all over the place. You can't go down a road without finding that somebody with a golden retriever somewhere. Everybody knows someone who's owned a golden retriever. Well, in the 1970s, there were two dogs, Cummings Gold Rush Charlie and Misty Morn Sunset. And they were both big winners, show winners. And a lot of dogs were bred to them. You figure, that's only two dogs, right? Well, fast forward from 1970 to now, and it's if you do the rough math of how many dogs they have registered that were related to them, just registered, never mind the ones that aren't registered, there's at least a quarter million descendants registered from those two dogs. Quarter million. So if there's a health issue in that path, in that narrow funnel, if there's a health issue, it's going to show up when you're breeding all those relatives to each other all day long and not even knowing it. And that's what happens with the popular sire. You know, we get, you get a really good English setter in Michigan, and everybody breeds to it, right? That's what you're supposed to do. Well, they all breed to just that dog. And all of a sudden, next generation, everybody's in the corner going, hmm, we're all kind of closely related here, boys and girls. Um, maybe we've got to go out and find something else to cross in. And I don't think we do that enough. I think we've got to focus more on more hybrid vigor in these pedigrees and um, finding stuff that's not – everybody wants to line breed and inbreed and – uh, to get that look, and I get that, but you also want them to live. And to do that, you need a little hybrid vigor. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just wanted people to uh, to to really hear your thoughts about that. And I, I just say I really want to thank you tonight for your time. And I, I would love uh, to be invited out to, to film and talk to the people once the American bully is established. Um, oh, you will be there. The you will definitely be there at our first event. Absolutely. And once again, thank you so much for your time tonight, Wayne. Seb, I can't thank you enough. I had a great time. You know, it was, it was really nice talking to you. And, um, and keep writing, man. It's, it's, uh, I know it's where your heart is. Oh, I'll, I'll, send, I'll, I'll send you the copy of the next book when it comes out in a couple of months. I'd love to see it. Love to see it. Oh, all right. Take care, Wayne. Thank you, Zeb. Appreciate it. Good night. All right. Okay, Bully Well, I want to thank Wayne Kavanaugh for coming on tonight. I hope you really learned a lot about him and, uh, and the direction of the American Bully as far as with the UKC. Um, I, I'm, I'm really appreciative for him taking his time out tonight and once again, I, I just uh, feel really blessed to, to to have a show like this. And as you know, every Sunday night we like to go out on a positive note. And I want to give a shout out uh, to the whole Bully community uh, for the support of Bully Talk with Zaire Pitts. And also, uh, when I'm going out to the shows, just talking to the everyday average people of the Bully community and filming their dogs. Uh, thank you all for your support. God bless.